Sean Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. Despite all the noise in political circles, the biggest issue that we may face in Arizona is water. We've got a water crisis brewing in this state. 22 years of drought has lowered reservoir levels to their lowest level and point in decades. Stage one drought restrictions are being implemented in several cities around the valley. And as you're about to learn, despite our explosive population growth, people are not the biggest users of water. Agriculture is. 74% of our water is used for crops, agriculture. The question is, can we do it more efficiently? In a moment, we're going to be joined by a water expert who's written extensively about the moves Israel has made to provide and conserve water in one of the most arid places on the planet. But first, Steve Nielsen on the water squeeze that's already affecting farms around Arizona. Like most mornings, Nancy Kaywood loads up in her car and drives around her 250-acre farm. The dust kicks up behind the back wheels, and in a few days, it'll be even drier. This whole farm will be brown and very dusty. She takes us to the main canal, the only water source for Kaywood Farms in Pinal County. That's the lifeline. That's like the artery and that's like the veins. The lifeline is stagnant. The levels are too low at Coolidge Dam for any water to get through. So the San Carlos water has settled here below the drain opening to her property. So we're done. We are done until we get rain. Kaywood has no idea when the concrete canals that carry the water to her fields will be filled again. Typically, the water flows through these openings to feed her crops. This would be closed. But the flood irrigation pipes to the alfalfa are empty. This will be our last cutting. We should get eight to 10 cuttings a year. Last year, we only got two, acre, two cuttings of alfalfa because of the drought. They switched to these alfalfa fields a few years ago. This is our livelihood. Alfalfa uses less water than the cotton they've grown for decades, and they've spent a lot of money to craft ways to conserve water on this farm. So we've spent thousands and thousands of dollars leveling our fields uh, and putting a slight slope so the water flows downhill. Before we ever put a new crop in, we go through and we prepare that field so they're as level as can be. Because water was cut off, in the next two weeks, she says all of her crops will go brown and remain dormant waiting for the skies to open. If we don't get any summer rain, I don't know what's going to happen. She says it's dire. It's hard to disagree when you look at the fields and the dry canals. This isn't just happening to our farm. It's happening most of Pinal County, Pima County, Maricopa. This is a look at this farm. Now, let's take a look at the big picture. As a whole, since 1980, agriculture use of water in our state is actually down 35%, while urban use is up 68%. That being said, irrigated agriculture still takes up 74% of our state's water supply. So as we begin tier one water restrictions, farmers, they're gonna see the biggest burden of all of this. As the state of Arizona sees a reduction of 30% of its supply from the Colorado River. It feels like there's a huge target on agriculture's back. Chelsea McGuire with the Arizona Farm Bureau says every farm is different. A lot depends on the source of the farm's water and whether they have wells. Last month, we showed you the historically low water levels at Lake Powell. If it persists, uh, you know, further reductions are going to have to be made. Because of many changes, like the 30% reduction to the Central Arizona Project allotment, water is expected to be high enough to continue to flow through the dam. Every farmer is impacted. There's nobody in this state who's growing food or fiber that isn't seeing direct impacts, production pressures, stress because of the drought. While nearly every farm has seen some reduction, cities have not mandated conservation. Tempe, Scottsdale, Mesa, and Phoenix have announced early drought stages, which means more education efforts, but they've not mandated water conservation for residents. We do feel like we're taking a huge hit, and yet, um, industry and is, you know, being encouraged to come in this area, which requires more housing, more people coming in our area, and we're in a serious drought. And so when you have cities, cities asking for water conservation, um, pretty soon the asking is going to turn into requiring. This year, Governor Doug Ducey pledged a billion dollars to find water solutions. This is the first time I've seen true serious discussion and serious resource dedication to the potential for water augmentation. How dire is the situation we're in right now? I don't know that it can be overstated. Uh, water is, of course, the most important resource that all of us use. 
Nancy isn't contractually allowed to pump for water at her farm and has already paid for this year's water despite dry canals. She feels like a canary in a coal mine for other farmers that still have water from sources like Lake Powell. If we don't start getting rain and if we don't start getting snowpack and they're going to dry up just like we are, I don't know that people realize how serious it is. She hopes the state's billion dollar investment will provide long term solutions. In the short term, all she can hope for is a wet monsoon season. We have to always be optimistic that maybe we'll get some rain. They're forecasting a, a wetter summer and you just you grab onto that, you know, with optimism that that's really going to happen and it'll green our alfalfa up. Steve Nielsen, Fox 10 News. As a poet once said, thousands have lived without love, not one without water. Joining me now is Seth Siegel. He's a world renowned expert on water, author of Let There Be Water, Israel's solution for a water starved world. Seth, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. John, great to be with you and great to be with the people of Arizona. Okay, tell me how much the imprint of Israel matches up with the needs here in Arizona. Well, look, Israel is not a landlocked country. It has a long sea coast along the Mediterranean and a short sea coast on the Red Sea. But other than that, you could really say that the two stories are almost identical. Both very dry places, both have experienced extraordinary population growth. Israel, in fact, has had the fastest grade of population growth in the world since it was, became a state in 1948, a country in 1948. Um, Israel um, has a dynamic economy. Arizona has a dynamic economy. Israel has made a strategic decision that it must grow all of its own food, or if not all of its own food, enough food for to withstand any kind of a embargo or boycott uh, from hostile neighbors. Uh, that's a legacy from a time when Israel was a, in a very different situation in its neighborhood. And as a result of all of that, Israel has had to learn how to be exceptionally efficient with the use of water so that it's seen its population grow 11 fold in about 70 years. And uh, Arizona has seen comparable happening in, in an almost similar time period. So what we, what we have here is a, a, a situation where Arizona is just like Israel in many ways, except for one. And that is that although Arizona has been facing water scarcity problems, a drought for about 20, maybe 22 years now, Israel made a decision decades and decades ago that it was going to get ahead of the curve and not allow itself to be victimized, such as the story of that uh, very sad story of that farm woman in your in your intro profile. Yeah. Uh, Israel began doing all kinds of things to prevent exactly that from happening to Israel. Let's talk about some of that, because this has been the this has been the conundrum. Uh, Seventy one percent of the earth is water. How is it that we have water shortages? Now, I know you've got to desalinate that water to make it drinkable. But it would seem that this should not be a scarce resource. Well, it doesn't have to be a scarce resource. Um, the problem is most of that water that you talk about is, is actually uh, unusable water because it's in the polar ice caps or it's uh, seawater. And the amount of actually uh, drinkable water, fresh, sweet, what's called sweet water sometimes, unsalted water, <clears throat> is only about 2 to 3 percent of the global water supply. So that's a, that, you don't want to be misleading about that. And also, some of the places where there's vast, vast amounts of water, the Amazon River, the Great Lakes, uh, Hudson Bay up in Canada, places like that don't really have the, the mass quantity of people living there uh, so that even, even with this fresh water, it's not always very valuable or usable either for agriculture or for settling cities. So, so, so you, have that as, you have that as a fundamental problem uh, going into that. And then you've got to move the water. If, if, for instance, if you wanted to tap into the Great Lakes or desalination from the West Coast for Arizona, um, you've got to move that water, and it's very, very expensive to move it energy-wise, right? Well, it depends. I mean, what, what has been done in many places, including in Israel, but not just Israel, is to use the force of gravity. And if you can use gravity intelligently, you can um, make very good use of that and transport the water without any external energy source at all. We'll talk later, I'm sure, about agriculture, and I'll tell you about a technology that does exactly that. Uh, but it's not in every situation that you have to transport the water, although sometimes you have to do push it uphill. Uh, what is expensive is creating the right of way and the pipelines from point A to point B. And even more so, as perhaps you know, that the Great Lakes all banded together, the Great Lakes in Canada, the Great Lakes U.S. states and Canada banded together 
a few years ago. They created something called the Great Lakes Compact, and it prohibits the transfer of water out of this very specific uh, economic and geographic zone uh, in exactly <laughs> yeah. in anticipation of their brethren in Arizona or other states <laughs> saying, hey, how about us? Yeah, share your exactly. Bounty. Share your bounty with us. So Israel, as I understand it, just for a point of reference, um, in the 1920s, British economists estimated the territory of Palestine, which became part of Israel, obviously, could hold no more than 2 million people because of limited water. Now it's home to 12 million people. So they figured out a way. What did Israel do that we should be thinking about here in Arizona? Right. And, and let me also point out to you, since some people follow this, this in politics in the news, the, the geographic space that you're talking about, the British were speaking about, is what is today the West Bank, which is a, still a disputed territory, mm -hmm. um, uh, all of Israel proper, and the Gaza Strip, which is now under the control of, of Hamas, uh, the terror organization, and theoretically of the Palestinian Authority. So that's what makes up the 12 million. Israel itself is a little, uh, a little over 9 million people. And, and what Israel did, and less true for, uh, for Gaza, because uh, they get water from Israel, and the West Bank uh, Palestinians get about 60% of their water from Israel as well. But what Israel decided to do before it was even a country, it became a state, a nation in May of 1948, starting in the 1920s, uh, around the time that that British report came out, there, because there wasn't an Israel yet, they didn't have a name for the country, it was called the Zionist leadership at the time, said, what do we need to do to assure ourselves of a vibrant future whereby we can see they didn't know World War II was coming, they didn't know the Holocaust was coming, but they had a sense that there'd be a large number of immigrants from around the world would be coming to this country. And, and, and also natural population growth of the people already there. And, and so what they said was, how do we figure out how to bring water from the water-rich parts of the country to the water-poor parts of the country? How do we get smarter about using our aquifers? How do we get smarter about using our one and only freshwater lake, the, the Sea of Galilee? But, but it's not a sea, it's a lake. But how do we make use of our, our lake water and the Sea of Galilee to, to help all the people? And then as the country became, uh, as, the, as they became a country and they started to have a little bit more money, they started investing in very expensive technologies, such as capturing all of their sewage treating it to an ultra high pure level so that you actually could drink it if you had to drink it, but no one does drink it there, and creating a parallel national water infrastructure system whereby the water gets transitioned to farms. Sound familiar for, for Arizona yep, maybe? Exactly. And all, all that water gets transitioned for farms. And then they spent billions and billions of dollars building out these salination facilities that now is the, but they don't, they don't waste that water. They use it because it's expensive water. They use it as precious water to use it for for urban dwellers, so that about 80% of urban water consumption uh, on, on average is from the desalinated sources. Is and it expensive because, in Israel? Sorry, to, is water expensive in Israel? Well, it's, it's a tiny bit more expensive maybe than it would be in the United States, but you get a lot more for it. Uh, you get in a very dry region, the people there live like, uh, from a water point of view, like they're living in New York or London. That's the thing uh, that's amazing. It, I look at the pictures and I hear the stories Israel has never had a water crisis or a shortage. Well, they, look, Israel is in the Middle East, and the Middle East is the driest region of the world, and 66% of, of the country is a desert. So it, 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 I don't want to overstate the fact that everybody has a swimming pool in their backyard, you know, and they're, and they're saying, please evaporate away our water. But, uh, but uh, there, and there have been droughts, and there have been crises in terms of, you know, people have to be careful particularly as they were ramping up the technologies to, to where they are today. But they haven't had a crisis in several years because of the fact that decades ago they began talking about and thinking about this, what was seemed to be an insurmountable crisis. And I'll tell you another thing that's interesting. In my research for my book, Let There Be Water, um, which I wrote for the common person, not for engineers or scientists or water people for that matter, what, 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 I, what I discovered from the research for Let There Be Water is that uh, the focus by the early founders of the state, the first prime minister, a man named David Ben-Gurion, he, he wrote in his diary almost every night, and I was had access to the diaries. It's, uh, it's a great historical tool. And he talked about water and water needs almost as frequently as he talked about security and attacks by neighboring states wow. and, and things like that. So, so when you have that kind of focus, 
not just a once in a while, oh, we really better focus on this because we have a bad drought kind of moment, but we're thinking about this day in and day out. It's really important. I, I have a lot more I could talk about that, but, but just the focus of the leadership is such an unusual thing compared to what we see generally in America. Right. Are you, are you starting to see that change in Arizona? Because we now know oh, Governor, yeah. Governor Ducey, oh, yeah. Governor Ducey yeah. putting a billion up to this, it's really a small drop in the bucket, pardon the pun, but that is a significant look forward, is it not? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, absolutely. It's not just the money. The money is important, but the mindset is more important, actually. The money will follow the mindset. The mindset, <clears throat> I'll just tell you, I've, I've had the pleasure, again, I'm based in New York City, but um, I've had the real pleasure and honor of meeting with Governor Ducey in his office, along with his water aide, uh, Buchanan Davis, a very gifted uh, uh, and talented uh, advisor to the governor. The governor himself has a passion for this, as you pointed out. I've had the, uh, the opportunity to meet with many members of both the Arizona Senate and the House, including uh, President uh, Karen Fan and, uh, and uh, Speaker Bowers. Rusty Bowers, uh, and every one of them has a concern about this. The transition that has to be made is that it has to go from being an elite topic amongst the political leadership and only them and talking down and talking around so that it goes down to the everyday conversation so that it becomes part of everyday life and people understand why they need to make sacrifices, perhaps, or why they need to pay more for water, perhaps, or why they need to have uh, excavations done to have rights of way for water transition, perhaps. And those are the types of things that I, I think are beginning also to happen and we'd like to see more yeah. of. But the idea of, well, I'll worry about the water when I need to worry about it when the, when the faucet goes dry, that is, the, that is the thing that has to transition. Where We have to think about, well, it's not dry today, but let's not wait until it's dry. Let's not wait, you know, let's not wait too much longer until right. it is dry. Right, yeah, we're in a 22 year drought and we're, we're definitely struggling. Seth Siegel is my guest. He's a world-renowned expert on water, the author of Let There Be Water, Israel's Solution for a Water-Starved World. When we come back on Newsmaker Saturday, they are watering crops in Israel using drip irrigation, just like in your backyard. It is saving a tremendous amount of water. Is it something we need to consider or do here in Arizona? And also, you may be surprised, we're using less water right now in Arizona than we were decades ago. How can that be the case? We're back with Seth Siegel right after this. Back on Newsmaker Saturday with Seth Siegel. He's a world-renowned expert on water. Seth, I brought up before the break that Israel is using drip irrigation now increasingly to water crops. How much water can that save versus how we're doing it, opening the spigot and flooding the fields? Well, let me frame this for your viewers, if I may. Please. Uh, Arizona, of course, is a, in a very dry region with very hot, especially summer temperatures, uh, which, which creates a lot of evaporation. And yet even, so, and also the, it's a very sandy soil in a lot, of the, um, a lot of the state. So you would think that Arizona would be desperate to use as much efficient ir irrigation as possible. Yet for historic reasons, Arizona has a majority, not just a little majority, a large majority of its irrigated fields that flood the fields. This flooding is on 89% of all irrigated fields in Arizona, 837,000 acres. And before I talk about Israel, I wanna talk about Arizona, if I may, for another second Please. or two. And that is that when you talk about the tier one cuts and the tier two cuts, you're talking about 500 odd thousand acre feet for the tier one and the tier two A, tier B, and all that will be about 625,000 acre feet, give or take a bit. And that is a gigantic amount of water. But if you were to be efficient and stop flood irrigating those 837,000 acres and instead not give up farming, because that would be a catastrophe of its own, which, which we can talk about, but instead use efficient irrigation techniques, you could save 100% of the water up to and including the tier 2B cuts. Wow. And we're talking about a fortunate, a fortune of water, an ocean of water. So, so this the, gets the, back so to what that's what that's what the opportunity is. Yes. When we talk about the difference between Arizona and Israel, the opportunity is to think about 
transitioning from a, a method, you can't even call it a technique, a method that's 5,000 years old. This is what they did in the Nile River in Egypt in the time of the pharaohs. And instead to abandon that crazy, wasteful, unsustainable way of irrigating crops, and instead to go over to drip irrigation. Now I'll talk to you specifically about what Israel has done and what, and what is coming from Israel now that will transform, I believe, transform the state of Arizona and its water future. Yeah, do it. Tell me right now. We're, we're, okay. we're all ears. So about, six, so about 60 odd years ago, Israel invents something called pressurized drip. Pressurized drip was a wonderful, was and is a wonderful invention, which requires a couple of things. One of which requires very clean water, so it requires filtration, it requires a lot of energy to push the water across the field, but it drips droplets of water on the roots as the roots need the water, and no water or virtually no water is wasted on evaporation. Really great. Plus, the secondary benefit is it changes the whole profile of how much fertilizer you need. So you farmer saves a fortune of money on fertilizer. And also the farmer isn't contributing to groundwater contamination or surface water contamination with the fertilizer. But push, push the environmental issues aside, push the carbon savings aside and all this. So this technique changed the profile of Israeli agriculture. And in the 60s or early 70s, Israel outlaws, outlaws flood irrigation. Wow. And so the choice for farmers were, OK, I still want to be a farmer. Now what am I going to do? Now, fast forward to a few years ago, one of Israel's real water geniuses, a guy who served in public service. He was the former water commissioner of Israel. He's a highly esteemed professor at the leading, one of the leading universities of Israel. He said to himself, I look around the world, I see an ever drier world, I see flood irrigation. He wasn't thinking of Arizona per se. He says, I see an ever drier world and we need to figure out a way to get a form of drip irrigation that doesn't require a lot of filtering, doesn't require a lot of energy to propel it across the field, and is really cheap because most farmers are growing commodity crops like cotton and alfalfa and citrus, and they're not growing tree nuts or wine grapes, which is really great with pressurized drip that was invented, as I said, about 65 yeah. years ago. And so this invention, it's called N-drip, like new drip, N-drip, is a game changer. Now, for full disclosure, I have an involvement now with the company, and I got involved with them not because of economic reasons, but because of policy reasons. I saw this as the ultimate savior of the dry southwest of India and of all of the kinds of places around the world that will spare us from having economic chaos and immigrant and, and emigrant flows all over the world Seth, from this we've, problem. We've got about a minute and a half left. It's amazing that we are actually in Arizona using less water than we were back in the 80s because we're trading ag, which is water intensive, for residential, which actually doesn't use as much water. So why are we in this situation then, right now? Because what you don't want to do, and it's a, it, would be, it's, it's a, it sounds, it's a facile solution. Nobody wants to be in the situation, if you think about it, of being in an agriculture-free world. It's good for your society. It's good for your environment also. If you get rid of all your farms and just build houses there, you're going to have a massive particulate matter. You're going to have all kinds of respiratory illnesses for your people and your society. Um, and it's just going to be a huge problem. You're going to destroy the economic base of, of that agriculture presents, and you'll create social problems with people who are, who are without work all of a sudden in your state. So agriculture is a benefit to every place where it exists. The challenge is not to change all your ag land over to residential land. You don't want that. What you want is you want to be able to have something like what you've had for a long time, but to be able to do it with efficiency. And that's why I mentioned this end drip idea, which is gravity yes. fed, no external energy, and very inexpensive. Hey, and we... that's the idea for, for what I think the great gift that Arizona can be thinking about and giving to itself and is giving to itself. Already thousands of acres are installed with this technology. Quick answer, any pushback from the farmers on trying to transition to this? Is it something they don't want to do or are they open to it? Some farmers, of course, always say, my grandfather didn't do it that way, but you, are, you would be delighted and surprised, and I am delighted, but not surprised, at the acceptance of farmers to this new kind of technology because they understand their future is tied to being able to do what they have been doing, but in a new, different, and better way. This is so interesting. we got to have you back. Okay, deal? I just ask. <laughs> <laughs> You're a mensch. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Welcome to New York. <laughs> yeah, Seth Siegel, world-renowned expert on water, and he has been consulting and doing some work with Arizona in this matter. How do we get, how do we get over the hump here? It's been fascinating, Seth. Thank you so much. 
Thanks for being part of this. Great Thank to you. see you. We appreciate it. Seth Siegel, we're back in a minute on Newsmaker Saturday.